thank you very much, Enzo, and thank you, Viviana, for organizing this and inviting me. Uh, so that's right. So um, I studied here. So basically, I discussed my PhD in this room in 2008. Uh, yeah. That's right, the feeling, right? So that was really, if I had known before that it was, that the seminar would be in this room, uh, I would have thought twice. Um, yes, and since then, I, that's right, so I spent some more years in Italy, and then I, I moved uh, to the Netherlands. And what I've done in the meanwhile is a couple of different things. So my PhD was on the philosophical foundation of uh, legal responsibility. So it was basically applied ethics and philosophy of law, and basically the book you see on the left side of, on the screen is basically my PhD dissertation uh, turned into a book for Raffaello Cortina. And uh, so that's still my interest. So philosophical issues of uh, moral and legal responsibility, what are the foundation, the uh, bounds and grounds of, of, of human responsibility. And of course, when I moved to Delft, uh, this topic uh, turned out to be quite interesting for issues of technology, too. So Delft is a technical university, as Enzo said, but uh, unlike Italian technical universities, it has a philosophy department into it. So I work in this philosophy department within the technical university. And basically, we do philosophy of technology and ethics of technology. So I am more on the practical side, applied ethics of technology, but there are also people doing philosophy of science, philosophy of technology, more at a theoretical conceptual level. And that's why, since I moved there, I started being involved, uh, uh, as Enzo said, in many issues related to emerg so-called emerging technologies like AI, robotics, and whatnot, where you have these issues of control, human control and human responsibility. And this is basically what we are going to talk about today. And this is a, an edited collection I, I prepared a couple of years ago for Rowledge on military drones and responsibility, right? Um, so, so I studied philosophy. Actually, I graduated in history of philosophy here uh, with a thesis on free will, actually. Uh, free will in John Stuart Mill. Um, then I got my PhD on philosophical foundation of criminal responsibility, so I moved to the applied side of things. And then now I do applied ethics of technology. And whenever I give a presentation to non-philosophers, which happens quite often, all, all the time, basically, because I don't work with philosophers anymore, uh, and it's outside Italy, I try to be you know, a bit charming, and so I start from uh, the school of Athens. And, but the reason why I start from here is that I, I, I always try to explain why philosophy can still be relevant, and should still be relevant also in present day society. And I usually say that my favorite philosopher in this uh, painting is known of the uh, main characters, but he's actually uh, Socrates. Uh, and the reason why I mention Socrates is, as you know, I don't have to tell the story to you, but the reason is this idea that philosophy should be a dialogue uh, with, b between different disciplines and should be a dialogue with people with different backgrounds, should be more a research for questions uh, rather than just the development of a specific uh, domain of, of, of study. And in that sense, I think that philosophy has still a role to play, uh, at least uh, not only because of its specific body of knowledge, but also for its methodology. So it seems to me a methodology that still can do the work of connecting the dots of different issues across different domains and different parts of society and that kind of thing. And that's uh, basically what I'm trying to do with uh, these projects where I use things coming from philosophical tradition but also legal concepts and, ish and apply these to issues of emerging technology. Also by discussing with engineers because as I say, now I now work mainly with, I teach to engineering students and I work with colleagues who usually have a background in engineering. So that's very interesting, uh, if a bit challenging topic, uh, thing to do. So, ethics of technology, uh, the idea, I mean, the project I'm going to present today is a bit, is relatively broad, but the sort of the trigger for this project is a uh, very specific public debate that has happened in the past five years. I don't know if you have followed the, the Stop Killer Robots uh, campaign and the debate that has followed. So, this is a campaign organized by some NGOs 
uh, including uh, Human Rights Watch uh, and some uh, roboticists and some uh, pol politicians uh, and people from the civil society. And their concern is, their proposal is a preventive ban on the development and use of fully autonomous weapon systems. Um, so fully autonomous weapons, so this is the website, it's topkillerrobot.org. There's a very nice page with all the references to academic and non-academic papers you want to read and whatnot. Uh, you can so sign up for the uh, petition and whatnot. Um, so fully autonomous weapon systems are autonomous, are systems that once activated can select and attack targets without further intervention by a human operator. So basically, uh, there are two ways to, make sense, to understand what we're talking about. So they don't really exist as far as we know. And if they existed, they are not officially used. Um, basically, all, all of you know about the uh, teleoperated drones, right? The ones that are used by the US and, and other countries to do targeted killings in Yemen and Pakistan and whatnot. Um, so basically, those systems are, have a lot of uh, technology built in, like sensors and uh, some sort of a, uh, artificial intelligence systems. Uh, basically, they can fly autonomously, but still there is some person sitting in a control room somewhere in Nevada, and this person still has the task to, uh, to pull the trigger, basically, when it comes to, to kill someone. So the idea here is to have a one step further and to eliminate also the remote controller and basically having these drones or could be flying objects, could be land objects, could be sea robots. Doesn't matter. The point is that they can be fully autonomous as in once programmed and activated, they can go do the surveillance part, doing the selection of target part and doing as soon as they see a target that is suitable for being attacked, they can attack it without any further intervention by humans. Right? So this is uh, something that technically can happen in the next, maybe it has already happened in the labs of the DARPA in the US or somewhere in the world. In the world. So there are concerns with this. And of course, the main concerns uh, can be summarized under two headers. One concern has to do with the predictability and the uh, uh, safety of the system. Basically, this is, these are systems that work by uh, artificial intelligence by uh, elaboration of a uh, big amount of data by algorithms and, uh, and basically they have all the risks and the problems that AI and artificial intelligence have in terms of predictability, in terms of risk of uh, misinterpreting the available data, in terms of bias, biases, in terms of many different things you may have uh, heard about in this field. And of course, these concerns are particularly serious here because if there is a mistake, uh, it's a mistake that can cost the lives of innocent civilians. Uh, and so it's a, it's a sort of risk we don't want uh, to, to, to run. And the second set of risks have to do with the problem of so-called accountability gaps. Uh, and this has to do with a, uh, in, indeed, with the problem of responsibility and that's the entry point for my interest in this, in, this, in this topic. Basically, there seems to be the possibility that once these systems that are fully autonomous are in place, you can have a, an additional risk where there is an accident and it's very difficult to uh, point to some human agent who can be, all, can be held accountable or liable for that. And we will see more why this is the case because there is a big distribution of tasks and there's a big, uh, a, 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 a huge amount of autonomy in the uh, thinking and acting of the machine itself, and there are, some, there are some issues of transparency in the way the machine works. So it could be difficult, at least according to our standards of moral and legal responsibility to attribute responsibility to a human. And why is this a problem? Well, because especially in the military, but not only there, uh, it is important that if an accident happens, we are, able, we are able at least to explain what happened. So it's not only about punishment. It's not just that we want necessarily to punish someone, but we want someone to be able to explain to the victims what happened and why that has happened. So that's why it's called an accountability gap and not just a responsibility gap. Because it doesn't to do just we want to point the finger and to blame and punish. This is part of the story too. Because as a victim, victim you also have sort of a right to point your finger to say human person. But that's a different part of the story. The most important part, at least 
as a society, it's also a democracy problem. As a society, we want to be able to know what happened and why. What were the reasons and motivations uh, behind a certain action, especially military action. So this is the, the basically the political problem. Now, uh, the political debate is about is it, is it a good idea to ban these systems or not? And if you ask me, I think it is a good idea to, to make a specific ban on this specific uh, aspect of military technology and even to the research in this field. But at the same time, I think that this will not solve the issue of autonomous systems in society, right? So it would be naive to think that by banning fully autonomous weapon systems for the next 10, 20 years, we have solved the problem of autonomous systems in society. So autonomous systems will happen in other fields, maybe not with full autonomy, maybe with partial autonomy, self-driving cars are an example of things that are in the newspapers every day, basically. But it's the same in healthcare, it's the same in finance, it, they're everywhere. So we can hardly stop them. So my idea, my proposal is that this idea of ban of a full autonomous weapon system is sort of a tip of an iceberg, uh, to use an abuse metaphor, for a big problem we, are, we have to address in society. We're gonna have these systems around, whether we like it or not, so the big question is how are we going to design and regulate them? What are the principal values we want them to work uh, according to? Uh, and so basically my suggestion is that under the surface of this obvious problem that is in, in the dark in the newspapers, the magazines, there's a big work to do in understanding what, what I suggest to call meaningful human control over these systems is, not only in the military but also outside the military. And this is the one of the controversial points I want to discuss with you today and how to design the systems in advance in order to have them, to keep them under meaningful human control. And in fact, the uh, first part of the paper is basically a methodological uh, presentation of the principles we uh, use in our department in Delft, which are broadly called responsible innovation and value sensitive design. So basically, the idea is uh, precisely that, um, so the Stop Killer Robot campaign have a point when they say that we should do it now. We should do a preventive ban and not just wait for the technology to be there and then to say, we don't like the technology, please stop it, don't use it. Because historically, as a matter of fact, we know that once a technology is there and once a technology has certain features, it will be used, right? For different reasons, for, uh, in economic pushes for political advantages. Once a certain option is on the table, that option will be used. Uh, if it is advantages, if it is really, uh, if, it, uh, if it is appealing for economic and political reasons, it will be, it will be very difficult to ban that. And probably it would be wrong too, right? Because at that point, it would be a waste of resources uh, and, and whatnot. So on the one hand, the Stop Killer Robots campaign have a point when they say, if we do want to stop this thing, we should do it now, because once the thing, once the thing will be there, it will be used. At the same time, we don't want to, to stop all the technology that presents risks, right? Uh, we don't. Uh, and so basically what we suggest is that we should try to assess what the certain risks of certain technologies are before it's too late. But, and here the story changes uh, uh, compared to the Stop Killer Robot, Cam Killer Robot campaign. But once we have identified certain risks, the idea is that if we are able to identify these risks or these critical points fairly in advance, when the technology is still in the early stages of its design, then we may try, and of course there will be a lot of political economical problems here too, but at least in principle it will be possible to try and design the technology in such a way that these problems are somehow anticipated and embedded in the, in the design of the technology itself. And that's why this is a very popular approach in the technical universities because this is something you can do with engineers, right? That's basically the point of having a philosophy uh, in basically non-engineering departments within a technical university to try and assist engineers in reflecting on the non-technical features of their technology from the early stages of its design to be able to embed these uh, ideas, principles in the design, to translate these abstract values, principles, moral, ethical, legal principles we have into the design of the technological systems. 
And in fact, this value sensitive design idea has, has been quite popular as applied to software. So it, it was designed, it was uh, developed in the, in, the, in the first place uh, in relation to uh, uh, information technology, ICT. Uh, so information communication technologies in the US. Um, and the idea was that we know the softwares are biased, the software tend to discriminate, that the way you design a certain software will affect the way in which society will be shaped and so, and so on and so forth. So the idea was that we should, from the very early stages of the design of the software, try to embed the, the values, to be aware that softwares are not neutral, and so to be aware that the way we design softwares will affect the way in which society will work and the way in which human relations will be shaped and whatnot. Uh, so now the idea is to expand this approach not only to software but to all possible technologies, right? And how do you do that? Uh, and the idea is that, of course, the objection is, hey, but in this way you're curbing technology, you're stopping technology, and the counter objection is not. Uh, no, you're just giving more requirements to the designers. So if you are doing for the early stages of the, of course, if you're doing once the technology is out there, then it's a problem because you are basically asking people to change what they have done. But if you put these requirements at the early stages of technology, basically what you're doing, just putting some extra requirements uh, next to the technical requirements and technical constraints that are already there, you're just adding some non-technical, so ethical, political constraints to design the technology. So you're just asking the engineers to be smarter and to keep into account more elements that they usually do, or different elements that they usually do. So they could even be, and that's at least the narrative we use to sell this idea, this could even open more opportunities. Just imagine you say from 2020, this is what's happening in, in the Netherlands, from 2020 only electric cars can be sold, full stop. Uh, this is a quite strong requirement, so you put it to car manufacturers, but that, mean, that means that you're just asking them to reinvest in a different kind of technology, not to stop doing cars, for instance. That's just a basic example, right? Right, and so the idea is that one standard issue you have in technology, in the design of technology, is this problem of trade-off of values. It seems like every time you design anything, uh, you end up having this issue where uh, you reach a point where uh, whenever you try to add a certain unit of a certain value or uh, uh, feature of the, of the product or the system, you are losing on, on, on some other values. This is a problem of trade-off. So according to my colleagues, uh, Jeroen van den Oven and others, uh, this shouldn't be taken as, a, as just as, oh no, you know, this is just how things are, uh, tough luck. Okay, no, if you are smart, precisely innovation means precisely trying to overcome this state of art where you can have a 2.0 version of the same product where this trade-off does not exist anymore, or at least is, is loosened or softened. So typically, other example of these days, you know, data protection with uh, Facebook and, and big uh, companies, uh, uh, web providers and whatnot. So again, if you ask, some people say, you know, just tough luck. This is just how it works. You cannot have all the services that Facebook gives you while keeping protection and control on your data. This is just how things are. Well, in the perspective of the design, it's just, no, and, this, and things are not good. So we should get to a uh, step two where you, we have all the, to redesign the technology and the, and the political, socio-political system in such a way that we can have all the advantages of these services while also keeping all the advantages of the data protection and whatnot. But again, now it's too late. So I think that Facebook and privacy is a great example where if we had tried 20 years ago in the beginning of the internet to consider the risks of data protection, maybe we could have come up with a smarter or different design of the, of the platform and whatnot. Now it's too late and there are too many interests on the table and, and these companies are too powerful probably to be uh, asked to change the, the, the setup of, the, of their platforms. So basically it is innovation is just not, it's not just according to the, this approach, it's not just a new product with new features, but it's new products where, so the metrics of innovation from a social, political, uh, ethical point of view is a product that can check more boxes in terms of values, societal values, non-functional requirements that can satisfy. 
And in that sense, and I'm moving to the topic of today slowly, meaningful human control can be seen as one of these attempts to basically to move uh, across this, um, in this direction. So basically, if you look at autonomous systems, be that military system, self-driving cars, you name it, uh, there seems to be this trade-off. So the more the system gets efficient and the more, more the system is innovative, uh, the higher uh, is the risk of unpredictable outcomes, uh, loss of control, loss of transparency, etc. Et uh, and, and it's the other way around. The more you keep the system safe and with a clear human accountability, probably the less you can improve in terms of efficiency and innovation. There seems to be a trade-off here. So the whole idea of this meaningful human control is to try to push the, 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 the threshold of this situation and to get to a point where we can have both efficiency and innovation while maintaining uh, safety and human accountability. That's the general uh, political, ethical goal we want to achieve here. And yeah, and this is something I just use with engineering students where they ask, yeah, but why am I supposed to do that? This is a political problem, this is an, as an ethical problem, just doing technology and you say, yeah, but by doing technology you are changing society, you are changing people, the way people behave. So you are taking a big responsibility, you are taking a big power and big, I hate to, to quote Spider-Man, but it's, it's Voltaire, by the way, so it can be quoted or even in a philosophy department. Um, anyway, with great power comes great responsibility. Right, so any questions so far? I didn't mention the fact that I'm happy to take questions during the, the conversation, so feel free to interrupt any time um, um, for questions or anything. Um, meaningful human control, uh, what's that? First of all, it's the title of a paper we just published, so you, you can read the paper if you want. It's, it's open source on frontiers in AI and robotics. Um, and, but what, what is the problem we are trying to address from a philosophical point of view? So let's try to move to the uh, philosophy part of the story. So basically, there is this problem of defining what controlling, what control is, right, uh, as a philosophical concept. Um, and basically, when applied to a, the control of a technical system, usually you have two extremes. There are those who equate control with being in the loop. So as far as there is a human who is in the loop, meaning that can intervene at some point into the uh, process, then the process is under, many, is under human control. This is typical in, within in information technologies, right? You have this complex digital system platforms, but as far as there is a human who receives information about what the system is doing and it can intervene into the system, then according to this very uh, uh, permissive view of control, then the system is under control because there is a human who is in the loop and can do stuff within the system. At the other extreme, you have the idea that control uh, equates the action of controlling. So basically, according to this other, so this position is that the other stream of the spectrum, uh, the system is in control if and only if the human uh, is steering the system, basically, right? So in the metaphor of the, in the example of the car, the car is under control if and only if there is a human with the hands on, on, on the wheel who is actually steering the car. So I think my intuition, our intuition, so this is a paper I've written, this is something I have to, to stress more, this is a paper I've written with a colleague, so it's not only my work. So what everything I'm saying is also uh, has to be credited also to Jeroen van den Oven uh, from my university. So what we, and that's the reason why I'm talking in terms of we, what we thought is that both of these, these intuitions uh, leave something out, something important out. So the idea that you can be in control just because you are in the loop clearly miss out on something, right? Because you can be in the loop receiving all the relevant information but a not understanding this information not being able to process this information in uh, uh, the required time to intervene, not having the capacity and the motivation to intervene at the right moment, the right time. So it seems to me this is too permissive. You can be there uh, without being in control, basically. That's one thing. On the other hand, the idea that in order for you to be in control, you need to have your, your hands on the, on the, on the uh, uh, steering wheel, this, is, this requires too much. Basically, 
my intuition is that you can be as a human being controlling the system even if the system has a big uh, leeways of autonomy in the sense of doing stuff without you. And by the way, this is the reason why we are designing autonomous systems because we don't want to do the things ourselves all the time, right? This is exactly the reason why we want to delegate part of the uh, task to the system. So basically our idea that being in control is probably has something of all of the two elements, but it's different than these two elements. And that's the reason why we have added this meaningful uh, adjective to characterize what we think being in control really means. So this meaningful is like, what, why are you really in control? Um, and our hypothesis is that you can be in control uh, without having your hand on the wheel, metaphorically speaking, uh, but so meaningful human control is basically something less than having your hands on the wheel all the time, but it's certainly something more and different than just being there and receiving the information from the system and being allowed to intervene into the system, right? So that's a general idea we uh, are exploring in this paper. And here the most philosophical part of the paper. Basically, in order to explore this idea, we use the debate on free will. And here my, here my master thesis, Amia Tesi, uh, uh, starts making some sense in this big picture too. Uh, so basically, uh, I didn't ask you what, what, what do you do? So how many philosophers are in the room? Okay, I think it's the majority. We can make a government probably here. Um, how many psychologists? Okay, what else? Computer science too, cool. Okay, I should have known before. <laughs> I would have been more cautious uh, in, in pretending I know how these things work. Anyway, no, that's good. So, okay, so I assume that at least philosophers, but probably also psychologists and computer scientists, if they have any interest in that, can be a bit familiar with this debate on free will. So, uh, it's important, I'll keep it short, but it's important. So basically, the question in the free will debate. So forget about technology and autonomous systems. Basically, we are starting from the good old free will debate, and then we are using one part of it to make sense of the concept of control over uh, in technological systems. So in the debate on free will, you have, at least in the way it is presented present day, these big camps of compatibilists and incompatibilists. And uh, the compatibility has to do with causation and freedom. So if you think that there is no way to reconcile the fact that everything that happens in the world can be potentially explained in causal terms and the fact that you see yourself as a free agent, as a human being. So if you think that there is no way to uh, reconcile these two things, then you are an incompatibilist. Then if you are, are an incompatibilist, you can uh, be two different things. If you believe, uh, this feels really like home. I remember that. I love that. Yeah, okay. Um, so, if you think that this reconciliation is not possible, then you can take two options. And you say, too bad for free will. Free will does not exist. It's, a, it's an illusion. As human beings, we are just, human actions are just natural events like any others. So, talking of freedom in, in, uh, in, in relation to human actions, just like talking of freedom in relation to uh, biological events or physical events, so it doesn't make much sense. Uh, or you may say, and too bad uh, for uh, uh, causation, right? And in that case, you are a libertarian. So you do believe that free will exists, and so there is something wrong with the idea that everything can and should be explained just in causal terms, right? This is if you are an incompatibilist, right? Or you may say, look, no, they, this problem is, is a false problem. In fact, you can both see the world as potentially explainable in causal terms and see the humans as freedom and responsible agents. And if you believe that, you are on the compatibilist uh, camp. Uh, then if you're in, I know, I'm, I'm summarizing the history of philosophy in five minutes, so I apologize. But it's functional to the paper, so it's just to give, to, to give you the sense of why I, we are referring to the free will thing. So I know it's much more complicated than that. But uh, in, in our reconstruction, basically, if you're a compatibilist, you can be an old-style compatibilist, basically uh, 
Hobbes, Hume, and just saying that in order for a human to be free and responsible, basically it's enough that you can describe his or her actions are caused by his or her internal states as opposed to the external states. So it's just necessary that you can describe an action as intentional, voluntary, in order for that action to be free in a moral sense and to be the uh, a fair target of uh, moral uh, considerations, including responsibility. The problem with this approach is that it, it relies, I'm, I'm nearly there, I'm nearly done with free will. Uh, so, but it's important. So the problem with this old style compatibilist is that relies on a too simple view of human action and human psychology, basically. It's a very mechanistic, modern time approach to human action. It's just about causation. It's internally comes from inside or it comes from, from outside. So it's, it's too simplistic, right? Uh, there is no space for the, the complex mechanism of the interaction between mind and world, and here is where psychologists can see more of the of the story getting juicy. Uh, and so that's why in present day philosophy we have a different form of compatibilist where the idea is that for humans to be uh, free in the moral sense, which is of course not free in the metaphysical sense, but free enough to be the object of uh, moral appreciation and condemnation, uh, they should have some very specific psychological capacities. Uh, that usually go under the header of rational capacities and so on and so forth. And some of these present-day compatibilists talk of co rational control, and here comes the link with the paper, as rational control as the key for making humans responsible for their action. So basically what we are looking at in this paper is this uh, um, bottom right part of the table, we are not looking at incompatibilist. We are not looking at those type compatibilist approach to free will. We are looking at present day approach, compatibilist approach. Why? Because if you are a libertarian, you tend to conceive of freedom as something, something uh, rooted in some sort of metaphysical uniqueness of humanity. And then this is not very helpful as applied to the control of machines, right? Because by definition, if this is something that holy humans have, you cannot use that in relation to, to machines. If you are a free will skeptics, then you are not interested in control very much by definition because it's, you know, nobody is really free and responsible, so why bother about being in control of things? So we are interested in the idea that there is some, something to be said about being in control, that being in control makes sense as applied to human actions. We, it makes sense to say that humans are in control of their action in a way that is different. Uh, than uh, the way in which other uh, natural events uh, occur. While at the same time, we want to avoid the simplistic idea that humans are in control just because they have intentions and they can act in a voluntary way. So there should be something more, and this is what we want to explore. So basically, the specific uh, approach we use is the famous Fisher and Ravitza approach to free will and moral responsibility in their book in the 98. 1998 book, uh, um, Freedom, Control and Responsibility. Well, I don't remember the title of the book. This is nice. Freedom and Control, something like that. Anyway, Fisher and Ravitza, 98, Cambridge University Press. Sub subtitle is a, a Theory of Moral Responsibility. And basically, they provide uh, two necessary and sufficient conditions for humans uh, to be in control of their own actions. So we're still moving at the level of human responsibility on their own actions, uh, not on external um, uh, uh, systems. So the two conditions are called the reason responsiveness and the ownership. Uh, let's go, and basically what you're doing in the paper, this is a spoiler, what you're doing in the paper is applying this to, trying to translate in these two conditions into two conditions for the control of the uh, uh, engineering systems. But let's see what the, the uh, conditions are in Fisher and Ravitza, and then we apply them to, we move to the autonomous systems uh, uh, thing. So basically, the reason responsiveness uh, condition requires the agent, the agent to act according to a decisional mechanism that, in the presence of strong reasons to act or not to act, can recognize these reasons and bring itself to not perform that action. 
to perform or not perform that action in a sufficiently broad range of circumstances. So basically, it's reason responsiveness. As a human being, you should be sensitive enough to the variations of uh, the environment and to adapt your behavior uh, accordingly. Um, uh, and if you are not so uh, sensitive enough to uh, the relevant aspects of the environment and including the relationship with other agents, then you are not uh, free and not uh, responsible uh, according to this approach. So a disclaimer, we don't believe that this is necessarily a good theory of moral responsibility, but we do believe it's a great theory as applied to uh, uh, autonomous systems. So we break the issue whether this is a good theory of moral responsibility as applied to humans. Probably it's not. But we think it's a great basis to be applied to autonomous systems. So this is the first necessary condition, but this is not sufficient in itself. In order for a human to be responsible, a second condition should apply too, which is the ownership condition. This is quite demanding. So on the top of being smart enough as a human, in, in being sensitive to what's going on, understanding what's going on, and adapting your behavior to what's going on. You also need to be able to, to take responsibility, to see yourself as the owner of the specific action you are carrying out in the world. And this means two things, that you should uh, see your, you should realize that your decisions and mental processes will eventually have an effect in the world, right? Uh, and this is not enough. Uh, either you should also understand and appreciate that this will uh, occur also to others. So you see your, action, your decisions are having efforts in the world, and you do realize that other people, so this is a relational thing, other people will see, your, will see the events in the world as something that you have done for which you have to respond. Right? So this is very much a social uh, skill, basically, a moral and social skill. So together, if you are smart enough in this sense of the flexibility to extend the reasons uh, uh, and to adapt your reasoning and action to the uh, relevant stimuli, condition A, A1, and condition two, you do realize that the way you think and the way you behave will change something in the world and people will see what's happening as something for which you are responsible. If all of these conditions apply according to fisher rabbits that then you are a free and responsible agent, right? Then I'm not sure this is a good theory of human responsibility. I think human responsibility is a bit more complicated than that. But we do believe that this is a great starting point to build up a theory of meaningful human control over autonomous systems. Basically, what we are doing is we are seeing autonomous systems. So the trick is we are seeing autonomous systems as something that does things for you. And so basically, we are presenting the relationship between you as an agent, a human agent, and the technical system as a relationship that is similar to the relation, should be seen as similar to the relationship between you as an agent and your everyday actions. And we are applying the efficient rabbitus conditions for appra appra appraising the freedom and responsibility of your everyday action to understand when the system can be deemed to be under your control. Okay? This is basically what, what, I'm do, what we are doing in the paper. Basically, and this is the original part of the paper, we are um, translating the two conditions of fischer rabitz into two conditions, the two conditions for guidance control over everyday actions into two conditions for what we call meaningful human control over the behavior of partially or fully autonomous systems. And the two conditions uh, we call in the paper tracking and tracing. So according to, and they basically follow the fischer rabitz conditions. They are adapted, expanded. So according to the tracking condition, in order for the system to be under meaningful human control, the system that mediates the agent and the world, so the system that is between you and the final outcome in the world, be it a self-driving car, military system, a computer, you name it. That system, uh, should have a twofold tracking capacity. Uh, first, it should track the moral reasons of the agents deploying it. So it should be able to the system, so here's you, here's the system, here's the word. The system should be able to adapt its behavior to your reasons as a programmer, designer, user. Then, of course, it is open to whom, to whose reasons it should respond. But it should respond to the, re the reasons of the relevant agents in the, in the system. Uh, in a fairly sensitive way. 
right? And secondly, the system should respond, should track the reasons that are out there in the environment. So simple example is military system. You have a robot, a drone, doing a certain, certain surveillance uh, a routine in somewhere in the Middle East. And you do want this drone, the drone is equipped with sensors and computers and whatnot, and you do want the drone to respond, to behave in such a way that respond to the relevant reasons of the humans behind him, behind, behind it, namely, at least to, to, to the minimal level, the uh, international law, right? Uh, you do want the drone to be able to recognize where a situation is, for instance, in line uh, with international law or is not, and to be sensitive enough to adapt its behavior to these requirements. And this is basically the number one concern of the Start Killer Robots campaign. What they say is, given the present state of art of technology, no system is smart enough to be able to apply such a complex set of rules and such a flexible set of rules that require human judgment and application as the international law is. Um, in the second capacity the system should have, the system should be sensitive enough in terms of sensing capacities and intelligence to recognize all the relevant aspects in the outside world, all the aspects that might be relevant for it to change its behavior accordingly. So, and why is this quite problematic in the present day military setting, because in the good old days, or maybe this was not even the case, but we, we love to think that war used to be a fairly simple thing with two armies with different uniforms. And so in that maybe non-existing scenario, uh, you may allegedly uh, relatively simply program a machine to say, just engage. So here's the war theater, so we are sure that ev everybody in this field are inside the game, so there's no risk of killing civilians, A. B, it's pretty obvious who is with you, who is against you, because there are uniforms, right? So in that kind of war, which probably has never existed, but in that kind of fictional war, which is probably a risk, it's not a real war, then you may think of a machine being programmed to attack and engage all those who have a certain specific recognizable feature, be that a physical feature like a uniform. Uh, but in present day world and possibly in any time world, things are much more complicated. And what you have to do according, at least to international law, if you want to play according to the rules, you have to recognize who is a combatant and who is not a combatant. And this is not a feature that you can have decided once for all because being a combatant is a feature that changes with time. The same person can be a combatant one day and not a combatant on another day, depending on the role he's playing on that day. And uh, that same person can be a combatant engaged in a hostile action or a combatant not engaged in hostile action. And recognizing a hostile action, as the psychologist can testify, is what, still one of the most difficult things even for humans, let alone for machines, to understand this you know, loop of intention and communication stuff in which, on which Ivan is quite expert. So the objection is this is a, one of the most complicated uh, cognitive uh, skills and it's quite naive to think that at least present day uh, machines can comply with that. So probably this tracking condition is a very demanding condition and we are not afraid to, to state that. So probably no present day technology can satisfy this condition in a unstructured environment like a battlefield can be. They can comply with that in a more controlled environment. And this is probably an interesting policy recommendation. Probably can be used in a, with self-driving cars in a segregated lane, but not with self-driving cars in mixed traffic, for instance. But this is just in for discussion. As for the tracing condition, which is supposed to mirror the efficient rabbit's ownership condition, this is quite key and I think interesting to get in some water. So, you can read it in the meanwhile. Basically, according to the tracing condition, there is at least, there should be, for the system to be in a meaningful own control, there should be at least one human along the chain of design and use. So it shouldn't be necessarily an operator. It could be a designer very early in the, in the chain of, 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 of production of this, of this uh, system. So there, but there is at least one human along the design and use chain who, at the same time, 
appreciate the possible efforts in the world of the use of this system. So it does understand how the system works and what the real capabilities of the system are. So they don't over or underestimate the capabilities of the, of the system under the specific circumstances. While at the same time understanding that others may have legitimate moral reactions towards them, the human operators, for the behavior of the system, right? So this is the fisher rabbit of social thing as applied to the mediated action of a system. And why is this relevant? Well, I think this is quite helpful. We think it's quite helpful to understand why this responsibility gap could happen. So two years ago, there was a first fatal crash involving a self-driving car. Well, one week, week ago, there was a second involving a pedestrian, as you have seen the, uh, in, the, in the news, the Uber car. Now, let's stick to, to the first one. What happened was this was a Tesla Model S vehicle, which is not a full, uh, fully autonomous system because it's, it's just equipped with a quite advanced autopilot, right? So you are supposed to be in the vehicle. And you are, when you buy this vehicle, you are given terms and conditions of use, and you are told that you are always supposed to still be attentive because this system is still in a beta version, uh, meaning that it's still under development, it's not fully uh, sh uh, safe and whatnot. So you're just told, here you go, here's the key, here's the vehicle, but please be careful because the vehicle is still not fully, you know, working. So just be careful and whenever you, I don't exactly know the detail, you, you hear a beep or you see a red light, whatever, you have to, to get in control again of the vehicle, right? So what happened in this case is, and you get no training specific anything. You're just informed that this is how things are. Um, and so what happened here is that it's according to the uh, investigation, what, so what happened uh, as a matter of fact is that vi this vehicle crashed at like 60 kilometers per hour uh, against a, a, a truck, a lorry, uh, which was uh, crossing the road. Basically, the, the sensing system of the car uh, was not able to distinguish the white uh, truck uh, from the sky, from the white sky. So it, it just saw the, the truck as part of the sky and said, so they, 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 the way is clear, just go ahead. Uh, and the driver was not attentive. According to different version, he was texting or even watching a DVD. Uh, he, and was basically, he didn't even touch the brakes. And so full speed car against the, 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 the lorry and this uh, poor guy uh, died. Now there was an investigation and according to the investigation, it was the fault of the driver because he was supposed to be attentive. And he, he, he had to, knew, to know better, right? So he was told that the system could make these mistakes and he was supposed to intervene. Is that fair? Was he really morally irresponsible? Well, according to our approach, there are some reasons to doubt that this is the case. Probably there was an interest of responsibility gap here. And if you look at our tracing condition, I think that the responsibility gap can be described by seeing that the condition A and B were not satisfied by any of the individual human agent. Because it feels like, uh, according to information we have, Tesla or the developers of the system or Elon Musk or some people working at the technical side, on the technical side of the thing, were fully aware of all the limitations of the systems and all the, the risks involved in using the systems. But they probably didn't felt responsible for that. Because by delegating the responsibility to the agent, they said, you know, now we're giving this thing to you and now it's your problem. From now on, whatever it happens, it's your responsibility. You, you are supposed to be attentive enough. So they satisfy condition A, but not condition B. On the other hand, probably the driver uh, was, uh, according to one reading of the story, the driver was satisfying condition B. He was saying, yeah, I know, I'm the driver, so of course people will think that I, that I am driving and I am responsible. But it's really doubtful whether he was satisfying condition A. If you look at the story uh, and to many other aspects of, of, of this, these and similar stories, usually users tend to overestimate the capabilities of these systems. They don't have any specific training to really understand how these systems work. 
you know, it's called autopilot, first of all. So no matter how much you tell me that I'm supposed to drive, it's an autopilot after all. So yeah, of course, I, I have to keep an eye, right? But, uh, and, uh, and if you watch on, this is really anecdot anecdotal uh, evidence, but if you watch on YouTube, there are a lot of videos of people driving the Tesla hands-free and say, you know, it works, you can even do this and that. And allegedly, there's even a video of someone working at Tesla doing so. So it's kind of, you know, gray area where it feels like Tesla is, and I mean, I don't want to talk bad of Tesla. Well, I do, but it's not the point. I can say the same of many other companies. So just saying that there seems to be this gray area where you push, you say, you know, it's beta version, but still it's really cool. So you just, just get it because it works. And other users, I think you are justified in overestimating the capacities of the system. If you haven't received any specific training and any specific explanation and you're never put in the situation to really appreciate how these things work. So it seems to me, if you ask me that there is uh, an interesting responsibility gap here, and this responsibility gap, this accountability gap can be explained and can be understood via this tracing condition where there was no individual human being along the chain who really satisfied both of these conditions. Questions so far? And also question to the organizer saying, so uh, Viviana, how long uh, am I supposed to, yeah, to so go? Yes, I mean, usually it's an hour or something more, and then... Why? So we started quarter past, so I can yeah. still have uh, 10 minutes or yeah. something. Mm -hmm. So basically, this was the story I wanted to tell. Uh, so I gave you the background, why is this important and relevant politically, societally, uh, what is the methodology, why are we supposed to uh, come up with such fine-grained definition of what control is, and the answer is that we want to design for meaningful human control. In order for you to design for that, you need a good uh, fine-grained description with clear conditions for the control to, uh, to, to occur. Um, what I can do in the next 10 minutes, and what I had a plan to do, was to present one specific project we have uh, in, in Delft, and part of this uh, MVO project. So MVO is the Dutch uh, um, Research Council, kind of, so basically it's the, the agency that has the money for research, right? The, those who give you the money for research. Like, if you want to apply for a grant at a national level in the Netherlands, go to MBO. Uh, they have some money and they, they have interesting grant opportunities. Uh, so we applied for this grant and we got it. And the grant is basically, the, the project is basically called Meaningful Human Control over Automated Driving Systems. So what we're trying to do is applying this theory to uh, self driving cars. Um, and it's interesting because they, but well actually it's not for a chance. So basically this specific funding scheme was a lobbying lobbied a lot for by my department. So basically they managed to have the Dutch Research Council, Council having a specific research scheme called Responsible Innovation. And basically the requirements to have the, these grants are precise that you apply this methodology of value sensitive design responsible innovation. Which means uh, first, uh, okay, this is the best way to see what the requirements are. So this is the research consortium. So it's quite a massive thing, okay? Okay, so uh, you need to have people for three different uh, areas. So people from science or technology, people from humanities, and people from social sciences. In this case, we have the uh, coordinator is a en traffic engineer who actually does with his department automated driving systems. Then it's a behavioral science person doing human psychology in traffic. And then it's me as the philosopher. Uh, and then on the top of that, you need to have private and non-private partners who want to be part of the project. And in this case, we had car manufacturers, uh, insurance companies, truck companies, the Ministry of Infrastructure. So quite, it's not my credit. It's basically this engineer who has this network. So I don't want to boast. Uh, Basically, I put a lot of efforts, but in terms of networking, of course, it was the networking of the technical university who, who did the job. But this is how it works. So basically, you have car manufacturers, uh, policy makers. This is a research institute for uh, road safety. This is the Dutch Institute for the uh, standardization of cars. 
Uh, this is the Dutch Institute for the Licensing. So in Italy, it's just one institute, it's the Motorizzazione. In the Netherlands, you have two, one that does the standardization of vehicles and one that does the licensing and training. And you have lawyers and you have, as I said, insurance companies and engineering consultancies. So one requirement is having this big, uh, and this I mean, mirrors this idea that should be a societally engaged project. Uh, where you take input from different stakeholders and you, re you talk to stakeholders, you uh, translate the results of the research into some guidelines that can be used by these stakeholders and whatnot. Basically what we use in, the, in this project are exactly these two elements, value sense design, meaningful human control. But the interesting part is basically, so I just, the reason why I mentioned this is that we are trying to uh, apply this idea of value sense design. According to this idea of value sense design, ethics or technology in the past, as I said in the beginning. It's not, you see? Well, it is. If we decided that at some point, when it was dark enough, we should have. Anyway. Um, it also feels like a, an airplane taking off. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. I, 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 take advantage to get a sip of water. Okay, good night everybody, and welcome to this night session of the seminar. <laughs> All right, are we okay with this? Oh yeah, we do. Oh, uh, we are. Okay, so this is a, a pyramid that has been uh, used uh, by another colleague of mine to explain how this design for values or value sense design should work. So basically, it seems like usually there is a problem of communication between philosophers and engineers, and this problem of communication has to do with the fact that there is a gap between the concepts we use and the things they really need when they do their work. So basically, engineers reason in terms of design requirements. So just tell me what are the parameters and the constraints I need to have in order to create a product. Don't tell me that the product should be fair, should be good, should be safe. This doesn't mean anything if you don't tell me what the parameters and constraints are. So same if we want to apply something even more challenging, which are ethical, moral, political values to technology, we need to work on this transition from values to these are our requirements. And we're trying to do this in relation to uh, automated driving systems and basically this is the structure of the, of the project. So first of all, there are all these uh, actors uh, giving input into the, into the uh, uh, process. And the basic idea is that we want to work on one specific value here, so it's just very limited, and the value is meaningful human control. We want to design systems for meaningful human control in order to get, and this is the level where engineers work, right? So tell me what the, inter the interface should be like. Tell me what the traffic system should be like. Tell me what the standardization process, so each of the stakeholders has usually a different question here. Just tell me what, the, what, what you want me to do here. Uh, and it seems like what we're trying to do with this, uh, so this is just an example of application of this paper basically. What we're trying to do is moving at this level where we're trying to translate sort of this abstract value into, uh, to in technical terms, to operationalize this value, to translate this value into norms that can be in turn translated into design requirements. And so basically, according to this paper, what we're doing is taking a value, uh, which is human control and responsibility, giving a definition to it, uh, giving some specific norms following which we can implement that value. In this case, tracking and tracing, which I have discussed and presented one minute ago, and then the, the tricky part where we need also the, the help of these guys is, okay, what does, how can technically track, tracking and tracing be implemented and realized into the technical system? And that's the more technical part of the story. Right, so I think this is basically what I had. Uh, and I guess we can stop here and just open the floor for some questions.